Can you say amen? Amen. I want you to hear a little bit of the word this morning. And then, uh, like I said, we'll have the announcements afterwards. But right now, I need someone to hear this. This, uh, this message came on my heart uh, some time ago. And I wanted to bring it to you. And, and, and there may be parts and bits and pieces that you've heard me say before in the past. But I think it's important that everybody hear this. Because we're headed into a time right now where we're getting ready to do some battle. Amen? Amen. And I want you to help me preach. Open your mouth this morning because I want you to help me preach. Hallelujah. We're headed into a time where we're getting ready to do some battle. And that battle, in order to be successful in that battle, takes a little bit of preparation, takes a little bit of understanding as to what you're headed into. I want you right now, if you have your Bible, and always have your Bible with you, open with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And go with me right there to a very well-known verse. Verse 13. Now I'm just going to use this verse to start in with the message here. I'm not preaching on the armor of God. But this is what I want you to hear this morning. Because this is for somebody who's hearing me today. Whether they're in this room or online right now. Whatever the case is, this is for somebody. Wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Thank the Lord. Now, I'm only going to go with this verse right here. This morning, and, and this is why the scripture in this chapter speaks to those who uh, and puts the emphasis on the preparation needed before the battle. Hallelujah. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. It puts the emphasis on the preparation needed for the battle, and by preparing, it goes on to confirm the endurance. You can have while in the battle. Hallelujah. And if this if this is done, then tells you what will be accomplished. What will be accomplished? All. All. I want you to look at that. All will be accomplished. If you see the screen there. Hallelujah. And where will this leave you? According to this verse, it will leave you. Standing. Uh, it will leave you standing. So as your pastor, my job is to help you prepare for what is to come so that in that day you can be left standing before the Lord. Standing in victory. Standing in your triumphant battle. For me, there is no one story than the in the Old Testament that we find that makes a great example of the preparation that we need before we go into battle. I want you to know, and I want you to keep this in mind. I'm not talking about a physical fight. Come on. I'm not talking about a physical fight. What I'm talking about is a spiritual one. The enemy can and will push people and issues to the forefront. And it will look like you're going to have an all out brawl. But the word of God reminds us that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Come on. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. How many of you have come across people you disagree with? How many of you have come across people that are argumentative? Are completely contrary to what you believe or what you want to practice? I want you to know those people aren't there looking for a physical fight. But I'll tell you who is there. The enemy is there to push your buttons. Amen. Right. 
Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I want to take you to the Old Testament. And I'm going to show you five things this morning that you'll find in the story we're going to go to that maybe will help you to prepare for what you're about to battle or where you're headed to when it comes to a battle. So I want you to go with me. I want you to go with me to the book of 1 Samuel. Go with me to the book of 1 Samuel. And as soon as you find 1 Samuel chapter 17, you can say praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. First Samuel chapter 17. Now, although I want you to listen very intently to what I'm going to say during this message, I want you to help me worship the Lord this morning. Don't stay silent. Don't stay silent. There's victory in the shouts of glory. There's victory when you open your mouth. Before you even go into battle, you need to glorify God. First Samuel, and you can hold chapter 17 because that's where we're going to stick to. First Samuel chapter 17, and I want you to go with me to verse 17. Okay? 17 and 17. First Samuel 17 and 17. Look at what it says right there. And Jesus said unto David, his son, take now for thy, and Jesse said, excuse me, Jesse said unto David, his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Now I know when you read this, and you start reading, okay, I know where you're headed, Pastor. I know where you're going. This is the battle of David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Well, I want you to know I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to the battle. Right? Mm -hmm. here's, here's an important thing, and I want all of you to remember this. I want all of you to remember this. How many remember the story of David and Goliath? We all remember the story. We could all raise our hands. We could probably recite a lot of it word for word. And a lot of the battle that David and Goliath that happened on the field in that valley and he slid the shot, hit the giant, giant, giant stories over. Right? Amen. Or at least the majority of it that we know or we understand. I'm not going to the battle. Because you see, there would be no victory if there had been no preparation. And here's the problem. We get, a, we get a lot of ministers and pastors and preachers who will preach on the battle. All oh, those glories. Look at the power of God. And it is. It's wonderful. But they tend to forget the preparation that led up to the battle. You say, preparation? Pastor, what are you talking about? Preparation. My point exactly. Hallelujah. My point exactly. Hallelujah. So I'm going to show you some five things that will help understand why David was able to go into that battlefield. Amen, amen, amen. And five things that are hopefully uh, you'll understand as to what makes you think you can go into that battlefield. Because you can. Amen. Because you can. Praise the Lord. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Because you can. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 17. Oh, hallelujah says again, now I want you to pay attention here. And Jesse said unto David, his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah of parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. Now the focus I want you to understand is on David and his preparation to meet the giant. The battle that David had with this giant would be remembered for centuries to come. But what happened in the short time before he went down onto the valley floor can teach us so much more about the victory over the enemies. But preparation for the battle was vital. The Bible tells us that Jesse had eight sons. How many remember this? 
Jesse had eight sons, of which David was the youngest. Amen? Amen. Amen. David was the youngest. There were three oldest brothers, the Bible tells us. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this. The Bible tells us that the three oldest brothers were there and had followed Saul to the battle. That left four other brothers at home that were older than David. Oh, hallelujah. But it was David, get this, it was David who was chosen to go and feed his brethren. He had four other brothers at home. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know what occupied their time. But David was not just lying around doing nothing. He had sheep he was attending to. He was a busy little guy. But he was the youngest. And they sent him, they said, here, take this food, take this parched corn, and go to the battlefield and feed your brothers. Amen. I want you to understand, he was the one who was sent. He was the one who was chosen. He was the one who said, you fit the bill, you go. Amen. Somebody say, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Now I want you to look at this. Go with me to verse 25. Go with me to verse 25. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel. Is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him he, even his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Look at verse 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Right. Now here's, I want you, I want you to get a, a good picture in your mind of what's going on. David was sent, first of all, for the purpose of feeding his older brothers. He was to go and give them nourishment. He was chosen to go into the battlefield and give them nourishment. Once he's there, okay, once he's there, he starts hearing about the man who's down on the valley floor. The man who's defying now the children of Israel. So David takes an interest and begins to say, who is this guy? What, what is this guy? What, who, what is he saying? What's going on? He starts hearing the rumbling that's going about the children of Israel and the soldiers and everyone else that's happening there involved in the battle. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. He got involved in the mission itself. David wasn't there to be involved in the fight. He was there to nourish or to give to feed his older brethren. But he took an interest in what was being done. He took a true interest in the battle itself. And was not only about to run so quickly out of the place, but they, the, the others began to run and they began to flee. And they, they, they saw the size of this guy and they said, oh no, that's not for me. And they took on. This is what got David's interest spurred. Sometimes, you know, the Lord calls us to a place and wants us to get involved. And the first thing we do is we back off. Tell me if it's not the case. Amen. We back off. We begin to push back and say, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. What happens? We begin to doubt ourselves. We begin to doubt what we're able to accomplish for the Lord. We begin to doubt what God has truly called us for. But I want you to know, you have been called. You have been chosen. There may be others that were more qualified. There may be others that were set aside for the job. But you have been called. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you're getting this, begin to say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. David was not the most qualified to be where he was. But God doesn't call the qualified ones. God qualifies the ones who he called. He qualifies the ones who he called. Once David was 
there. He asked and he was asking at least twice around what was going on and who was this man? Not because he didn't understand. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I don't want you to lose this point. Hallelujah. He was asking because he could not believe someone would receive a reward. Get this. For an enemy that was already defeated. That just went right over some of your heads. <laughs> David could not believe that some of these guys were running back. The battle's over here. Where are you guys going? And then when he heard that a lot of, that whoever defeats this man, man, they're going to get the riches. They're going to get the king's favor. Woo! They're even going to get the king's daughter. David was like, well, what are you guys all running for? And it wasn't the riches that enticed David. It wasn't the riches that enticed David. But what he couldn't understand is why he had so many of his brethren running when the enemy was already done for. Amen. Some of you aren't getting this one. I don't know. Have you read the end of this book? Have you read the end of the book? I'm not talking about verse 7. I'm talking about the book of Revelations. Have you read the end of the book? We win. We win. We've already won. Give a hand clap to the Lord. We've already won. David looked at this circumstance in that same vein. He says, I don't know where you guys are going, but we've already won. Why are you guys running from this guy? Hallelujah. Some of you are still trying to grasp that. I can see it. Some of you are still trying to get a hold of that one. As far as David was concerned, the giant screaming at them had already lost. Someone was expecting that they would be rewarded for killing him. He's already lost. The battle is already ours. Somebody say, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. The battle is already ours. Hallelujah. This is something that David understood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do we understand this? Amen. Amen. Or are we still shaking in fear? <laughs> oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Look at, look at verse 28. Look at verse 28. And this is where things begin to start getting a little tricky. And Ilya, his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down here? And without, why hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thy heart. Thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Look at 29. David said, and this is his question, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? David said, what are you jumping all over me for? What are you, what are you mad at me for? I'm just asking. Isn't there a reason to be asking? Yeah. I want you to know something. David's a tapper. Look at this. Even before he went down to the battle, David's a tapper in this case did not come from an enemy. It came from his own brother. How many of you see that? Amen. Being told he had no business there and even his brother accused him of failing to do his other responsibilities. Ooh. I want you to know if you're called of God to accomplish a task, you will find out the first ones to discourage you are those who are closest to you. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now here's, here's something 
here's, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll make this a little personal testimony here. When I was first called to come down to pastor, this would have been more than 10 years ago, almost 13 years ago when I, they asked me and they appointed me as the pastor at our, at our church state convention to come down and the pastor in the, in the San Fernando Valley. When that happened, it took my family by surprise. It took my family, not my family, not my, my kids and, and my wife. We prayed about it. But my extended family, it took them by surprise. I have one sister. I have one sister. I love her with all my heart. She's the best sister. She's one year younger than I am. And I love her to death. But at that convention, she approached me and she said, What are you doing? Where are you going? I told her, Mija, I said, Mija have to go? She said, we haven't talked about this. I love my sister, my sister Priscilla. I love her with all my heart. And she loves the Lord. She was raised in a household with a father who's a pastor. We were raised together. So she understood how the ministry works. When God calls, he calls, you go. Amen. Amen. And I don't say this to disparage her at all. If anything, I expected pushback from my family. But she was the first one to say, where are you going? We haven't talked about this. She didn't live with me. She didn't live with me and my wife. She has her own family. But she said, where are you going? I said, I'm, I've got to go. The Lord's calling. I've got to go. And eventually, I think it took several years for her to forgive me from leaving. We even lived on the same block. We even lived on the same block, so we were neighbors for a long time. But I love my sister, and she prays for me every day. Because she knows the work of the ministry is not, is not an easy one. But when, when that happens, when you're called to go, when you're called to do for God, when you're called and given a job, and given the authority by the Lord to move forward and continue on in the ministry, the ones who will attack will be the closest ones to you. And I don't consider what my sister did an attack, but was more of a reaction to shock. But it was an example of what David ran into. His oldest brother turned around and says, Hey, kid, what do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? He says, Hey, isn't there a reason to be asking? Nobody's doing anything about this. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, praise God. But I want you to know something. It's more than just getting up and going. It's more than just picking up your roots and moving on. As a child of God, you're called to have a good testimony. As a child of God, you're called to have a good testimony in what you leave behind so that you can have a good testimony in what you're moving into. My testimony, when I came down from, I've been pastoring the English speaking in that church, and it was time, God was telling me it's time now to do something else, and I left a good testimony there, and I was heading in to some place with a good testimony. Look at this. David told him, what are you talking about? Look all the way back at verse 20. Look what David had done before he went to the battle. Look at verse 20. And David, David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. Mm -hmm. And he came to the trench as the host was giving forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. I want you to know that if David was going to go, he knew he still had responsibilities there. And he ensured that his responsibilities there were taken care of. And they had to be before he could move on. Mm -hmm. Before he could go, because he knew this wasn't going to be a quick trip. And here his older brother is, is, is accusing him of, hey, 
Don't you got other business you're supposed to be? Why, why, who's watching your sheep? Jim said, don't worry about that. Somebody's got a hold of them. That ought to speak to our heart. When we're ready to move into the work of God, make sure that our testimony is one of not quitting or deserting or forgetting or not worrying about what God has done before. Now the Lord has called me into a great thing. You know what? Get that one done first Amen. before God can use you somewhere else. Amen. Somebody Amen. say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. As a child of God, we are to see through our commitments we make before the Lord. Nothing is dropped halfway. When you've told the Lord once, let your nay be nay and your yea be yea. How many have heard that verse? Amen. You've told the Lord, yes, I'm committed to this, then be committed to it. His good testimony, David's good testimony, to follow what God was calling him to do meant he left a good testimony where he was. Verse 31. Look at, look at verse 31. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he was sent. I want you to know, they started, they started, hey, who's this kid? Who's this kid who's asking all these questions? Why is, why is he saying that somebody can go down and take care of this guy? What's he? Who is some, You know what? Somebody better run and tell the king. <laughs> somebody better run and tell the king. You want to know something? I believe they ran and told the king about David because they were scared to death. They said, you know what? If we can get this guy to take the fall, we'll be done with it. Come on. Come on. Sometimes when we're called before the Lord to do some some great work or some, some menial work. Doesn't matter the, the, the scope of the work, but if we're called of God, there's always going to be somebody saying, okay, you got it, I'm out. Yeah. Tell me if that's not the case. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, oh, he's got it. He's got it. And he can handle it. Somebody tell somebody tell the pastor, he's got it. Pastor, he's got it. Right over here. <laughs> The work of the Lord. There's plenty of work for the Lord. <laughs> There's plenty of work for the Lord. But in doing this, those who advocate their responsibility, those who abandon that responsibility and pass it on to someone else, has just lost a blessing beyond measure. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. <laughs> when we leave that work, when we leave God's work to someone else, we lose a blessing that the Lord had intended for us. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Look at this. I want you to go. I'm going to go quickly here. I'm going to go quickly. Then we'll wrap this up. But I want to go quickly. Look at verse 34. 34 through 37. Look at what it says. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took the lamb out of the flock. He went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. My servant slew the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Look at verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Here's another one of the points I want to make to you. Never. Ever, never, ever forget what God has already done for you. Never forget what God has done for you. Where he has put you. What miracle he has done in your life. What battle he's given you victory over. What healing he has done in your body. What victory 
he has already granted you. Because it's in this that we find strength to go on to the next battle. David would do this sometimes, and I believe that it's, it's, it's important that we don't forget this. He remembered the victories that God had led him through before. David had gone around, he hadn't, he hadn't gone around boasting about this. This wasn't something he was telling everybody. Hi, my name's David. You know, I've killed a lion and a bear. How you doing? I'm David. You know, I, I once killed a lion. I once killed a bear. Wasn't something he did. Because he recognized that it was God who done the work. Amen. He recognized that it was God who gave him the understanding on how to do it. When God has done great things in your life, there is a time to testify. And there is a time to acknowledge God. But when we understand that it's not we ourselves, but God who does the work in us, that's where the victory is. Amen. That's where the victory, give a hand clap to the Lord. That's where the victory is. Amen. I believe that the story for one reason, you know, there are scholars who say that they don't believe him, that this, uh, this was something David was probably just telling the king. Come on, the king who killed a lion and a bear. There's scholars who believe, well, this was probably just a made up story so he could impress the king. You know what? I believe it was real. But here's why I tell you why I believe it was real. If God had truly prepared him, I believe that he had prepared David with the courage to fight and kill a lion and a bear. So if that was the case, this giant was nothing. This giant was nothing compared to what he'd already gone through. I'm not about to stand up to a, a, a lion and a bear. <laughs> if I fought a lion and a bear, I don't want to do it again. But it was something that David went through that helped him understand these wild animals that you put down. Here's another wild animal out here for you to put down. It is what we go through, it is our experiences in God that cause us to have the faith to take another step in what God is doing with us. Come on, somebody say that. Amen. But again, look at this. David did not rest on those victories, but he used them as reminders of the strength that the Lord could give. Yeah. How many of you receive strength because of something God has done in your life? Yeah. I think there is not a one in here who would not raise their hand or could not raise their hand and say God has done something in me that has brought me new strength, that has given me new encouragement, that has built my faith just ever so much to now be able to withstand what's coming against me now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 What have you battled already? Think about it. What have you battled already? I'm sure each of us would have a testimony that could last all afternoon long. Of some of the things we've already come up against. And God has given you victory over. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And when you step up to that next battle, you remember the victories that God has already given you. Amen. <laughs> and I guarantee you, Amen. it will give you new faith to go forward into the next battle. Praise the Lord. Look at this last one. Verse 38. Saw so armed David with his armor and put upon him a helmet of brass upon his head and also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded with a sword upon his armor and he essayed to go for he was he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, look at this, I cannot go with these. 
for I have not proved them. And David put them off. And he took his staff when he heard it cheaply in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag which he had even in a scrip and with his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine he went into battle with what he had what God had given him nothing more David depended on what he had and what he knew notice that he didn't reject the way it had been done and prepared the way that, and, and had prepared for others in that way but in the end he made the decision that he could not have victory the way others had gotten the victory with the little he had he knew he had more with God when Jesus sent out his disciples, I want you to think about this. When Jesus sent out his disciples, he told them to take what? Nothing. Not even an extra tunic. Why? For the same reason David took only what he had. He knew the battle was not his. <laughs> The battle was God's. Oh, hallelujah. Give a hand clap to the Lord for that. Here's, here's the problem. There are too many who want to do the same thing the same way. Listen to what I'm saying. There are too many who want to do the same thing the same way. You're not someone else. You're not anybody else. God has called you for a specific reason. And, and this is speaking to somebody in here. God has called you for a specific reason. You're not like anyone else. God has given you the tools you need right now to battle what you have and what you need in him. You don't need anything that the pastor can give you. I can hand you my Bible. I can hand you my Bible. With all of its notes and all of its input in, all of its little script notes I have on the side, highlighted pages and everything else. And if I say, "Hun, take it. This will help you in the fight," she can look at it and say, "Not for me at all. Hallelujah. Not for me at all." The Lord has given each of us in our heart and in our mind and in our soul the strength to fight the enemy on His territory. But because it's not you who fights, it is God who does the fighting. It is God who does the fighting. It is God who does the fighting. It's not you. He said, just pick up what you've got and get in the business. Amen. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I want you to stand with me right now. Hallelujah. I want you to look at these five points. And I want you to see how they impact you. David, <laughs> he was sent. He was sent. He wasn't the most qualified, but he was the one who was sent. Amen. Do you realize that you have been called to go? Do you realize that? That you're the one who the Lord has called. You know how I know that? Because you're the one in here right now. You're the one listening to my voice. You're the one who's getting the word of God this morning. You're the one who's been called to go. And before you even give that excuse, David wasn't qualified either. <laughs> David wasn't qualified either. But the Lord qualifies the one who goes. Oh, hallelujah. He got involved, number two. He got involved. He didn't just stand back as an 
observer. He didn't just stay there and cross his arms and says, so who's going to take him on? Who is it? He says, somebody tell me why nobody's going. Explain to me why nobody's going. He took an active interest in wanting to see this thing defeated. Have you gotten yourself involved? Have you taken an active interest in the ministry that is right there in front of you? Or are you standing back with your arms crossed saying, so who's going to do it? Number three, he resisted the attacks that came on him from those closest to him. Have the attacks on your ministry stopped you? When you know that you've been called by God to do what God has called you to do, nothing and no one should discourage you in fulfilling the work God has called you to do. Number four, he remembered what God had done. What have you battled already that you can say, look at what God has done in me. Look at what God has done through me. Look at what God has used me for. I can do this. If God can do that, God can do this. Number five. He went with what God had given him. There was nothing new. There was nothing extraordinary. There was nothing over the top or even borrowed from anyone else. He had what he had and God said, that's enough, just go. What has God given you? You can say, Pastor, I, I, I really don't have anything. I, I really, I don't have any talent. I don't, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I, I really don't have anything. Moses tried the same thing. He says, I, 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 I can't even talk. I, I, I really can't even talk. And God said, you know what? You need to shut it. <laughs> you need to shut it. God says, who made your mouth? He says, if you can't talk, take your brother. He can talk. God gives you already what you have to fulfill the work he's called you to do. He's not calling you to start a $10 million ministry. He's telling you to just talk to the one who's right next to you. Oh, hallelujah. He's not telling you, I want you to reach thousands for me. He says, just start with the one that's looking at you right now. Just walk over to that person and share my love with you. In those battles, we have instant victory because we've already won. Yes, we have already won. Yeah. Right here where you're at, close your eyes. Let's go before the Lord. Let's go before the Lord. Let's thank him this morning. Father, right now as we come before you, before your throne, we thank you, my God, for the anointing of your Holy Ghost. For what you've given each of us in our hand, in our pocket, in our minds, in our hearts, Father. Because whether we realize it or not, we're already prepared to go as long as we remember who's doing the fighting. Because it's not us. It's not us, Father, it's you. You're the one who breaks down the strongholds. You're the one who opens the heart. You're the one who clarifies the confusion in the mind.
mind. You're the one who heals the body. You're the one who subdues the emotion. You're the one who brings clarity, Father, to that foggy process. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Just use us, Father, because we know the battle is already won. <laughs> the battle is already won. Help us to understand this, my God. Help us, Father, that we would lift you up. In every way and in any way, Father, let it be you who is glorified, my God. Let it be you who is glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give glory unto the Lord right now. Amen.